community discussion with them. Thanks, Janthi. So the recording is on. Um, we have several areas of the budget adjustment that we've been um, digging into a little bit, so would love to open it up to committee discussion. Do you have some thoughts? I didn't say I wanted to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you always go first. Um, in 2014. Interesting enough, I just saw the FNM commissioner in the hallway, and he said, I'm headed to appropriations to talk about the judicial transfer for. I said, Well, you go in and tell him. You can't. You're waiting for House GovOps to come up with a recommendation. Finance and management. So I don't know that he's going to say those words, but that was my advice to him. Um, no, I just I think you went through that laundry list. Most of it's pretty much that we would agree with, except for that area, whether we make a recommendation. And the other area is whether or not we want to entertain what the what Mike Smith, Secretary Smith, said yes, asked for yesterday. Is there any, anything else that we're are loose? Well, there's four issues, Okay. five issues that are five that we need to make a decision on. Okay. And um, are you supposed to introduce the bill because somebody just came in looking for you? Oh, yes, I am. Sorry. I said my piece. All right. All right. Ron it, was. Ron, 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 okay, good. Is that you. your balloon, Bill? I did that last week. Okay. Um, any, anyone else have burning thoughts or concerns or statements they want to make about the budget adjustment conversation? Who's looking at me? <laughs> was privatized. So an outside company takes care of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would like to know how much involvement they have, what the oversight is into their accounting principles. Mm -hmm. um, or at least to issue some kind of statement from this committee saying that even if companies or sections of state government are outsourced, uh, there is still a responsibility for overseeing their accounting principles. Yeah. I would say it's <clears throat> really concerning to me that there was a wide, such a wide swing from surplus to deficit and um, and I don't feel like we've seen a full accounting of exactly where that came from. Um, somewhat ambiguous references to administrative costs not being accounted for doesn't really um, doesn't really explain it. Gotcha. <coughs> Bob? Well, that that's the whole for me. That's a lot of administrative costs coming over a course of three years. Yeah. In addition to the reduction, kind of irresponsible is that the rates of the, uh, the whole thing are just mm -hmm. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, so let's push pause on this issue um, because Representative Chena miraculously appeared moments after we asked him to come out and join us. So we were just launching into a different discussion and we thought it might take a few minutes for you to get here, but we are. Glad that you're here, and we're doing um, just a 15 minute on each of the bills that is on our wall. And um, I understand that you're the prime sponsor of 464. Yeah. So I prepared a, a little presentation. It should be about seven minutes. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to time me, but I'll 
I'll, I'm gonna, it's 150 for the record, so I will begin. So this is Brian Chena. Oh, it's 151, sorry. 151 for the record. This is Brian Chena, state representative from Burlington. I'm here today to talk about H-464, an act relating to law enforcement training on appropriate use of force, de-escalation tactics, and cross-cultural awareness. So the purpose of H-464, and this language is in the bill. It's to require the collection and distribution of data regarding the use of force used in a traffic stop. The, it requires the Criminal Justice Training Council to develop a model policy regarding the use of force, the escalation, and cross-cultural awareness. And for law enforcement agencies to adopt a policy containing each component of the model policy. And it requires the Criminal Justice Training Council to report to the Executive Director of Racial Equity regarding trainings on the model policy and race-based data collection. So the rationale for this bill, um, that use of force along with race data collection, existing fair and impartial policing policy, and training, implicit bias and otherwise, is a another aspect of a broader discussion appropriate civilian oversight of law enforcement. This bill will ensure more robust oversight, enable us the ability to manage our progress, and provide a consistent approach to use of force statewide. Oversight and consistency are critical, particularly in police practices of use of force, and an accurate, complete, and consistent data are required to ensure fair government for all. So the context of this um, is that Right now, use of force data is not currently collected across all state law enforcement agencies. During traffic stops, a host of other data is collected, but we're not documenting use of force consistently across all law enforcement agencies. Burlington, um, which I'll use an example of being a representative from Burlington, knowing that it, there's wide disparity around the state in these practices, Burlington has reported on use of force data twice in the last three years. Um, the City Council of Burlington passed a resolution that the police department has to collect use of force data annually. Collection of, of this data will provide insight into the magnitude of the problem and will allow us to measure our progress um, on the statewide level as well as on, so in other words, it's not enough that one municipality does it because we need to be measuring um, the fairness across the whole state. And a model policy and training will provide consistent expectations for use of force practices across all state law enforcement agencies. So quickly, we're at two minutes, we're doing good. <laughs> Definition of use of force. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but this is a, a screenshot of Burlington Police Department. You can see that they have a sentence at the top, the amount of effort required by police to compel compliance by an unwilling subject. And they get that from the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, there's a citation at the bottom of the screen there. It's just um, to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we say, when we say use of force. Um, when we talk about training around escalation versus de-escalation, um, I wonder if this will work. Watch me screw the whole thing up. Ooh, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you can see here that escalation, you know, is when tensions rise and you go from no force using commands to maybe touching, having hands on. Less lethal would be like electronic weapons, spraying people, and then deadly force is shooting, you know, or, or beating someone until they die. Um, whether it's, you know, not that it's intentional, but that happens. You know, physical conflict leads to death, and I'll give you some examples. But the point of this is that we, we, what we're proposing is to train officers more in this piece. Um, the more skills you have in de escalation, the less likely you are to go up that pyramid in a, in a, in a situation. And then we have um, cross-cultural awareness. So cross-cultural awareness builds a greater understanding of cultural differences, including but not limited to race, color, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sex, sexual preferences, gender identity, disabilities, age, socioeconomic class, socioeconomic class, and veteran status. Those, these are a lot of protected classes, but the point is that people who have different experiences there's subcultures in our culture, and if you if we don't understand those differences, sometimes we misunderstand people, or we can't communicate well with people, and that escalates conflict. And to make um, to give our law enforcement officers more skills in this area, especially as um, they're dealing with more of a diverse population. Um, the, that this training would improve decision making through increased awareness of bias and prejudice. It strengthens communication skills and emotional intelligence. And it increases the ability of an officer to build trust with others and have empathy. And so these three pieces of training would be giving law enforcement officers more skills um, to prevent some of the problems we've been seeing. So 
two minutes to do this. So this is just some numbers. We're not going to dig into this here, but perhaps you would take some testimony to dig into this. This is from the Burlington's 2016 report out. That's how the data looked. That's how it looked in 2019. So you can see there's an inconsistency in reporting from one agency. This we pulled from the, the census website, and there's um, links if people want to explore <coughs> either of those sources. But what you see, just as an example, let's look at this. This is race from 2012 to 2018, where this is just one year, so there's a disparity in how they're reporting it. But if you look, black, all use of force incidents, 20.9%, but the general population estimated 2019, 5.3%, for almost four times higher rate of use of force of police against black people. Just one example of a disparity um, based on general population, white alone, 85%. And white was 72%. So do you see it's not equal to the percentage in population in terms of use of force? We could dig into that another time with other witnesses who are experts in this area, but I just want to give you some numbers. Here's some qualitative examples. We have to, we had 15 minutes, right? So I guess I don't have to do it in seven. You don't need to do it in seven. Okay, all right. Because yeah. I can I can take an extra minute, but. Um, here's some qualitative data. So we had three um, high-profile use of force deaths in Vermont. Um, these are Burlington examples from Burlington. We had Wayne Brunette, a person struggling with mental illness, shot by the police while holding a long-handled shovel on his parents' lawn in 2013. And the city of Burlington ended up paying a $230,000 settlement to his estate in 2019 after um, to make amends for what happened. Uh, Phil Grennan, a person in mental health crisis, was shot by the police while wielding a knife in his apartment in 2016. His death led to the formation of the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission um, here in Vermont. Um, Douglas Kilburn, a person living with disabilities, was punched in the head by a police officer in the emergency room parking lot of the University of Vermont Medical Center. And he died two days later. His death was ruled a homicide. Um, and so these are just some examples of how uh, there were incidents with law enforcement involving use of force that led to death. In some of these cases, the law enforcement officers resigned. Uh, this is not, not only is this bad for the general public that people die because of our use of force policy, but it's not good for the workers either. And um, I, you know, we could dig into this more if you wish, but I bet we could find some examples of people, workers who have trauma because of the, the interactions as well. Um, use of force injuries. So there are three lawsuits in, uh, pending against the Burlington Police Department right now, all from in the last year or so. Uh, with allegations of excessive use of force. All of the plaintiffs are African American. And there's body cam footage out there if you want to see what these incidents look like. You can find them on YouTube. Um, this, the lawsuit alleges that the city failed to adequately discipline, train, or otherwise direct or supervise police officers concerning the rights of citizens and victims, thereby causing police, including defendants, it's, this, is all, uh, this is all from an article, so the, this is public record. Um, I, was quoting it, and so the article's down here. So I'm not, I'm not trying to make this about the individuals. I'm just giving you a quote, so I'm not going to read their names. Um, that it, it, allow, it include defendants who were police officers to engage in the unlawful conduct described above. The lawsuit also alleges that despite the department's written policies, the police administration allowed a pattern of behavior to form within the ranks of the police department, which encourages the unlawful use of force against minorities. And uh, a, a response to the newspaper article by the assistant deputy chief of police, a person who had committed a crime and who was known to be a person who has been involved in many crimes in our city, fled from police, was pursued, tried to evade, and was unsuccessful in doing so, and ended up being apprehended. That's good police work. So I think what this shows you is that our policy has shaped a culture that's leading to a problem. Um, and so if we want to change this, it's not about holding individuals accountable. We need to change the system that's generating the problem. And so just some closing thoughts. Police have a challenging job, and it's getting worse for them. And dealing, they're going to have to deal with increasingly complex and stressful scenarios. They're currently being trained to use force. Um, do, uh, do, they're currently being trained to use it in a certain way. In a neighborhood planning assembly meeting last week, um, one of the one of my constituents asked a police lieutenant, um, "Why do you shoot to kill?" And the police officer said, "We don't shoot to kill. We shoot to control the situation." And the room gasped, like, "What? Like, how's that?" So, just putting it out there, that's not an individual saying that. That's training. That's policy. That's that's shaping these responses we get. And so. It's not good for anyone. And so by changing policy, 
we can change training, that will change the skills our workers have, and then that will ultimately change our practices, and then that changes culture. And then ultimately that culture change hopefully will make things better for everyone. Um, in addition to that, data must be collected, reviewed, and shared in a meaningful, transparent way to increase accountability of the government to the people who we represent. Um, there should be some standards about how that's done. And um, the state government must diligently review data to make informed decisions that take better care of our law enforcement <laughs> workforce and the general public who they protect and serve. So um, I'm hoping you'd be interested in taking up some testimony on this bill. We do have about four minutes left for questions. I just want to put this screen up. I see some, some of these people might be in the room right now. Um, I don't know if you know you're on this slide, but we have some, some recommended uh, witnesses from different, different stakeholders who might be affected. You can see law enforcement in terms of the Attorney General, public safety, uh, the state police, the Burlington Police Department. We have the Racial Equity Director, the Human Rights Commission, ACLU, um, as well as activists um, and advocates. And I also think it would be good, maybe public hearings or some way to engage the public family members of people killed, people hurt by the police, advocates. And you know, something I didn't put here because we have administration, but actually maybe the police union and the workers. Um, I didn't put it up there, but as I'm going through the presentation, I'm recognizing that maybe we should have put the police union, not just their management. Because uh, workers, you know, if workers have input into this and understand it better, I think we'll have uh, buy-in and they know best the job. So I think there's a place for them, an important place for them at the table in helping us um, to provide them with the skills they need to do the best possible job for Vermont. So um, last but not least, we have questions, and I have Abenaki here in the Dodd Mawaganol. Um, this is just a, a demonstration of cross-cultural awareness. I figured let's put the final slide, make it bilingual uh, English and the uh, indigenous language of Vermont. So that being said, do we have any Nadad Mawaganol? I'm still learning English. <laughs> Um, I have a question because I couldn't quite read your list because I'm not wearing my glasses. Back. But this um, one? Yes. Um, do you have recommendations on um, on people who could represent the community of folks who are in mental health crisis? Since the examples that you gave yeah. were, um, and the, I think the examples that many of us can think of in our own communities are. Um, people who are in mental yes. health crisis. Um, I would suggest that we ask the members of the Mental Health Crisis Commission, if they can. I don't know if it's a, if it's a conflict for them to be reviewing cases. Sorry, reviewing cases and talking with us. But I would ask Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, um, NAMI, the National Association of Mental Illness. That's for family of people with mental illness. Um, we could also ask designated agencies if perhaps they want they had a way to ask clients or if they wanted to weigh in. I do think that um, there's a disability rights organizations. There's the um, I, we have so many government um, groups that I, sometimes I can't remember the name. But there's the it's like a council, a disability rights council. I might be getting the names wrong, but um, I think those are some groups you can go to to get the perspective of, of people who. Um, struggle with uh, mental illness. Another thing um, we don't, I didn't mention it in my presentation, but people living with homelessness, um, we might want to go to some of the, the housing organizations too and see if they, maybe they can get some people living with homelessness to talk about their experience. As you heard today on the floor, um, when, when um, the person gave the devotional, he mentioned wanting to be able to sleep without fear of violence, and that's violence not just from other people who are homeless or people drunk walking by, it's also police violence, honestly, sometimes. So there's some, that's some more examples. I, I, I don't know if you were taking notes, if anyone was taking notes, but. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Questions, committee? John? Um, so you, you want there to be training through the Criminal Justice Training Council. Correct. We want them to have a model policy of what training looks like and then requiring every agency to um, adopt policy that meets those requirements. Um, I think it, how the mechanics of it work, I would suggest we bring them in and share with them the concern and see what they suggest. Because it may fit into some of their existing work. You know, like it might be an extension of existing work that we're asked that they do with police. They already do offer training. Yeah. 
So it might be just enhancement of the training that they're okay. doing and, and, and taking it further. Like, I, I think this is where you know, it's good to have witnesses come in and testify what the pros and cons are, because then it, would, it, would make, it, would, it can make the idea better. So. Questions? I think this kind of policy change is important and critical, but how do we hold these agencies accountable to live it out? Well, in, in, in this bill, it talks about two processes to help keep it, that would help keep the agencies accountable. Um, that collecting data is a way of keeping people accountable because if we have data collection and reporting, then the public is seeing it, elected officials are seeing it, and workers and people in the agency have something to measure progress by. And But right now that's inconsistent throughout the state in this area, even though there's other areas where my understanding is there is greater consistency of that. Um, the other piece of accountability built into here is the number three, which is we have a new executive director of racial equity who's looking at um, how systemic racism and looking at um, disparities in our criminal justice and schools, you know, in our, in our systems of government. And so her, she would be, um, she would be, there would be a report to her regarding the trainings and the data collection. So we'd have someone in government also checking on that. I will say the Racial Justice Alliance, who I wor I'm working with on this <laughs> bill and a few others, has created their own data sharing page that I can if you all haven't gotten it already from them, we can send it to the committee. They created, it's like a data dashboard that they created to demonstrate what the state should do. Like they took state data and made a dashboard. It's not everything we're looking for, but it's an example. That's another way that this people, there could be accountability is perhaps with the data collection is, is a way to make it available to the public in an in a interface and in a, in a way that's meaningful and that's like people could click on things and it's like easy to access. And the reason I think that creates greater accountability is that public awareness makes a difference. It, it, and then we as elected officials are accountable and the people can hold us accountable if things aren't getting better. I mean, it's, it's elected officials who appoint people often into certain positions who then hire people. And so the, I don't know if that's, Covers some of it of what you were saying, like in addition to training. So, other questions, committee? Perfect. Well, thank you for your very thorough um, bill walkthrough. That's uh, you. You did more homework than many folks who introduce bills and bring them. Well, and I tried to keep it to fifteen. I think we went a little over, but no, you can't. You can't control how many questions we ask. Yeah. You can ask more if you want. I'm not, I, I, this, is, this is a lot more engaging than sitting in an auditorium. Um, well, Did you give that to our committee assistant? Yes, so it's posted. It okay. Yeah, that, I'm actually accessing it through. I'll Thank shut you. it. I'm accessing it through. See, I clicked through on it there. our committee page. Yeah, yeah that's so. wonderful. So we can go and look at those links if we want to. Yeah, and so can I see there's a camera. I don't know if that's ORCA, but I mean, the part of that too is that the general public, if people want to review, they can go read the articles, look at these data sites, see what's out there, um, and be educated about what's going on. So, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you always have donuts? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we should, don't you? I'm going to do a short form universal, universal donut access bill. <laughs> A member from Barrytown was gracious to be the sponsor of uh, this morning's donuts. <laughs> Thank well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to run back to my committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Six thirty-four. That's you. Okay. Oh. So folks, we're going to do um, we're going to do a quick walkthrough of H six thirty four, State Ethics Commission, and then we need to switch gears again to go back to our budget adjustment um, memo. And before you get started, John, I I'm going to need to scoot out to have a conversation with. Uh, down in the speaker's office, so if I'm not here, uh, I will let you go ahead and, and navigate the budget adjustment memo. Okay. I trust you guys will 
put all of their best efforts into it. This is your chance. Okay. For the record, I'm Representative John Gannon from Wilmington, and I'm here to talk to you about H63, H63, H634, which is a bill co-sponsoring with a member from Chinden. Um, this came, I was asked to, to introduce this bill by the State Ethics Commission's um, Executive Director, Larry Novins. Um, a lot of the bill is basically cleanup. Um, of some things, um, and, but there are two real substantive changes, which I'll go over in detail, but one is to actually have the State Ethics Commission um, propose an enforceable state code of ethics, um, which would then go to the General Assembly for, for final approval. So there'd be a two-step process, State Ethics Commission would create, we would have to approve, then it would be enforceable. Um, so that, that's one of the big changes. And the other change uh, more is, is changing the sunset. Um, the State Ethics Commission is going to sunset it at the end of this fiscal year. And so that's moving it up, adding another year um, so that it continues in place for another year. So those are two big substantive changes. So now I'll go through each change that's in the bill. Um, the, the first change um, uh, is with respect to financial disclosures of executive officers in the state government is changing their financial disclosures from a, a biannual process to an annual process. So every year, instead of every other year, they would be required to file financial disclosures. Um, they would also, with respect to that disclosure, have to certify that the information on the pages is true to the best of their knowledge, information, and belief. So that would be an addition to what they have to do. Um, you know, many of the disclosure documents we all fill out require you to, to sign a statement very similar to that. Um, and so those, those are changes. Um, it would also require commission members to annually file financial disclosure. Um, so that's the ethics commission would have to do that. Um, and then uh, there is a minor change um, to uh, who appoints members to the State Ethics Commission. Um, one of the members was appointed by the Vermont Human Resources Association. Um, that entity really doesn't exist, and it should be the Society of Human Resources Management, or SHRM. SHRM is actually a national organization with state um, Councils. So the state, the Vermont State Council would appoint one of the members to the State Ethics Commission instead of the Vermont Human Resources Association. Um, so I think that's a fairly straightforward one. Um, it also changes um, that if you're an elected judicial officer, um, you should not serve on the State Ethics Commission. Um, for P, for a little bit of history with respect to that, um, the former chair of uh, the State Ethics Commission became an assistant judge um, while well, she was still, I believe, serving on the Ethics Commission, so I think that's why that change was made. Um, they want to change the term from three to five years for, for State Ethics Commission members. Um, let's see. Okay, it gives them authority to employ people if so, but obviously that's a budgeting issue. Um, and there's no budget, re there's no appropriation request in this bill. Um, <clears throat> procedures for handling complaints, I don't think. Okay, so here is the start of the thing. The Department of Human Resources does not have a code of ethics. Um, it has certain sections of its personnel <laughs> manual um, that refer to ethics issues. <laughs> uh, so what this is proposing to do is just clarify um, that the Department of Human Resources does have some ethical things, but they're in their personnel policy and procedure manual. And it, it is my understanding that those procedures are, are not necessarily enforceable. Um, So this changes advisory opinions, as I think we all know, there were some challenges with respect to advisory opinions, or at least the first advisory opinion that was issued by the, the Ethics Council. Um, 
it just this changes the language that says that the person who is subject to the provisions of this chapter may request it. So it can't be an entity that is not subject to the provisions uh, of this chapter. So it would have to be a state employee, um, a state officer, um, or a member of the legislature or judiciary who is subject um, to the State Ethics Commission. So it can't be deeper, for example. Um, that can ask for an advisory opinion. Nor a candidate. Nor a candidate. Um, they can ask for you know written written requests for opinions. Um, new change. The executive director can seek comment from persons interested in the subject of an advisory opinion under consideration. This is the sort of bring in if they need an expert with respect to an issue that they can talk to those people. Um, and so here is the big change. Um, on or before November 15, 2020, the State Ethics Commission shall submit to the House and Senate Committees on GovOps a proposed state code of ethics for the General Assembly to consider enacting into law. So this is the most significant change in the bill. So right now, there is no enforceable state code of ethics. Um, and, uh, you know, Having recently done a training on ethics, uh, you know, we in the House and Senate don't have a lot of ethics rules. Um, so I think it's important um, as a state that we actually have an enforceable state code of ethics in order if somebody violates it, um, there, there's some action that can be taken. It's also a way to, to educate people about what is, you know, what is ethical conduct and what is not. I mean, we don't want to trap people. Um, but right now, without an enforceable state code of ethics or even House or Senate rules that really deal with a lot of different ethics issues, um, people don't know what's necessarily ethical. They more have to go by their own moral co compass in the state right now. And so I think this is an important step um, to help guide people to know what is ethical and what's not. Jim, did you want to jump in with that? Yeah, no, my understanding is a number of states have this currently. Yes. I don't know the number. Um, but this section of the bill is just pushing the question, it, you know, we're going to have to come back and talk about it next year. So nothing <clears throat> changes until next year if we and others decide to move that forward or we like what the recommendation is or want to tweak the recommendation from the uh, ethics director. Is, is my understanding. Is that correct? To, you know, with respect to code of conduct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we could tweak it. That's the whole purpose of bringing it to the General Assembly, right. is the General Assembly gets to take a look at it. Right. Rob? A um, couple of questions. Mike. Sure. Sir, um, why the change in the disclosure as far as from biannual to annual, but what's the motivation behind that? I just think to have more current disclosure with respect to a person's financial circumstances and things do change on a, on a basis. Um, I think many other states and the federal government require annual disclosure, so it would be more consistent with what other states and the federal government does. Okay. And then how about the change of term from the three to five years? Why, why that? Uh, I, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Oh, so they were concerned about people leaving um, the commission and, you know, Stagger terms and just making sure yeah, they had more institutional knowledge there. So I think that's the reason for that change. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> when it got established, were the terms set up as staggered to be given? Yeah, they are staggered. Right. But we have five members, so five year term would ensure that there's some institutional knowledge always on the, the board. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, uh, there's one other thing, is, is the sunset provision. This section was to be repealed on June 30th of 2020, this year. So it extends it out to July 1st of 2021. We give the Ethics Commission another year of life. Um, and, but they would have to come back here again next year um, to see how they're doing. Um, obviously, OK, so what's not in the bill? OK, we created an enforceable code of, you know, state code of ethics. Um, there still isn't a true enforcement mechanism for that. 
um, except you know with respect to like the House and Senate, we do have you know ethics panels that can enforce rules against members of the legislature. Um, there's still not really an enforcement mechanism for state employees, especially state off statewide officers such as the governor, lieutenant governor, um, secretary of state, and the state treasurer. Um, you know those complaints. If somebody files an ethics complaint against them. They go to the Department of Human Resources. And as I understand from the executive director of the Ethics Council, go nowhere. I mean, that's an issue that's not touched on in this, but you know, I think you know, we've just started down the road with respect to standing up an ethics commission. Um, I think having an enforceable code of conduct is a way to start training people about what is and what is not good ethical behavior. And I think that's an important step to take before we start mm -hmm. aggressively enforcing it, in my opinion. Jim? So, Representative Gannon, um, if we were to adopt this bill, especially putting in motion adopting a code of ethics um, next year, could one argue that this is removing a little bit of the fig leaf that some have been quoted in the press lately? Yes. OK, thank you. Questions for John? We'll have plenty of opportunity to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice job, Representative. <laughs> I'm sorry I did not have a PowerPoint. Uh, we were just talking about you. It was all good, though. <laughs> okay. We're on the record. Um, so I think we just want to go through the outstanding issues that we had in the Budget Adjustment Act. Um, and I think that the first one we had uh, relates to the Workers' Compensation Fund and the State Liability Fund. So we started talking about that. Marsha started talking about that. Um, she has concerns about the contractor that is you know, now doing the workers' comp. And the oversight, and the oversight of the oversight. contract. Right. Definitely not. Jim? I don't know how we would know that. I got to, I mean, I want to think that. FNN is if they're noticing a trend of increased expenses, then you know, is, are there more injuries, or do we have a workplace safety issue, or are the admin fees uh, too high? I mean, I, I don't know that we're in a position to ask that, but I, I guess I just look at this there's a deficit in that fund, we ought to try to put the money back in. Um, and be honest with our accounting, and that's what it sounds like they're asking for. Uh, I mean, if you think there should be a one-liner to say, give us some more information, you know, sometime about um, the tr trend of the fund in terms of costs uh, or administrative charges, we can do that. Bob? Well, the, the weird thing to me is that in in monkeying with the rates, they effectively backfunded the departments more than the original appropriation. So there's two things that are sort of weird. One, they're not watching a cookie cabinet. And two, money that we effectively didn't appropriate to go someplace went someplace. And apparently that got spent. So this is, I just, I don't, I don't remember what they said about how far in debt they were now. Four to five million. So we're talking 20 million bucks here over the course of three years, which is inconsequential in terms of budget, but in terms of public policy, it seems weird. Well, he was loose on that. It might have been five years. I don't think he had all the. Yeah, he said four to five. He yeah. said four to five. Okay. Yeah. So sure. well, he did. But whatever. I mean, it's an unhealthy yeah. trend. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're not budgeting enough up front. Apparently, they're not managing the finances. Well, it may be. I well, know. but you could have just a few claims that could make that swing the other way. Specifically said, 
it was because they reduced the rates, and when they did so, they didn't take into consideration the administrative fees associated with it. Right. No, that's the testimony. I mean, you're right, Bob. Um, there's two causes for it. So, I, I mean, all right, so let, let's just do a consensus. Are, are we okay with the appropriations? I mean, I think they're, I, uh, personally, I think they're necessary. Yeah. I mean, there's a deficit. Mm -hmm. you know. um, so, but now I guess, so what, what, if any, guidance do we want to provide to appropriations around this issue? I mean, I, for one, am concerned that because they're using a surplus this year, if we um, run into a recession you know, in next year or the year after, um, that we'll be unable to, to fund the deficits um, in workers' comp and state liability. And, and so that is, that's my, my concern, because and I guess I'm concerned about their plan going forward. Do you run into a issues? I have no idea what they provide appropriations each year when they go through like next year's budget. Um, but would it be appropriate here to add a sentence to ask them to, I don't know if it's us or if it's approach or if it's uh, commerce, whoever looks at the details on working comp expenses, but give us some background I, maybe there's no increase in workers' comp each year, and they're just not budgeting enough. Well, well it, it sort of just jumps to my mind that, you know, this is a self-funded sort of pool, similar to the health plan. And sometimes, regularly, it used to be what they would do with the health plan was declare a premium holiday, uh, which saved the employees 20%, but saved the administration 80% or sure. whatever. So I mean, it's not like this is a, an isolated, isolated instance and it's something that happens this way. It's sort of maybe the, the thing to look at is that from a management standpoint, we say you can't put anything in a deficit situation and there's a reasonable customary amount that you should keep in a fund that provides for a you know, that type of self-funding sort of mechanism. It seems to me when this whole thing transpired, <clears throat> underneath the Shum administration like that, um, there was some language in there, I thought, that you had to look back and there had to be a certain level of savings for it to, to continue. That's correct. Right? So I'm, I'm, I do find it a little odd that Somebody is going to farm it out, or well, in in the context of farming it out, that there had to be a justification. There had to be a, a significant. I forget what the savings was, twenty percent, or it seems like there was some number associated. But somebody should be looking at this. I I thought every year to verify that it's doing what it was intended to do. And I, I do agree, it does seem a little odd to have that much of a hole. Um, especially if we're talking about administrative costs not being allocated. And we would have, can I add on to that? We would have to sign a new contract with them, which I think is, is that every two years, two-year contracts for services like that? And then at that point, the performance is supposed to, there are performance measures in the contract and they are supposed to be looked at I don't know what the review cycle is on that. You have to say that was three or five percent or something. Yeah, I, it seems like it's actually higher. Yeah, I, I think Ronald's right. I think it's higher. Yeah, it's at least ten or twenty percent. But I don't. The, the point is of how often it gets reviewed. I don't well, I mean, Adam did testify that they are now reviewing on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. which I think was not the case prior to before. Yeah, I really don't think that it's the, the fund manager responsible for making the payments. It's his administration. 
doing something that they should have done. And, and he basically said that I'm responsible for it. But we're in a hole. We've got to fill. So are, are, those, yeah, be fill. are those costs just attributed to administration or it just seems? No, they're also the, they reduce the premiums too. Oh, that's right. So there's two causes. Yes. Yeah. They weren't accounting for the administrative okay. costs, and they reduced the premiums when they had a surplus. Right. Now, the concern is, how did they get such a large deficit? Because it doesn't appear they were looking yeah. right. at what was happening to these two funds. So I guess we could encourage um, the administration to continue on a month-to-month -month basis monitoring these two funds. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know, John, are all agencies across state government build the same percentage of payroll, or does transportation get a higher end because that, of more interest? That's a very good question. We didn't hear testimony on that. Um, and I think, I, I, you know, in talking to Marsha, there, there's some accounting issues here um, that we may want to look into as a committee rather than a, a, dealing with this in the, the Budget Adjustment Act about what really happened here and, and exactly are these funds distributed evenly from agency to agency or can F&M decide, oh, we're going to help AHS out more because their budget's really tight this year. I don't, uh, at least some of the testimony we heard from the judiciary was it, it, it no, and even from Adam yesterday, you know, he said that they can decide who they're going to help. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's a great. I mean, mm -hmm. but you know, they're managing their budget, so I sort of understand it. So I think you know we can talk to Sarah about whether we want to take more testimony outside of the Budget Adjustment Act with respect to this issue. Um, I mean, Tom was just here. I mean, wouldn't that be human personnel office that might oversee some of that? Yeah, but I'm, I mean, what guidance are we going to provide to appropriations as part of the budget? Yeah, just maybe it's too complicated, and if we yeah. want to... And I mean, we need to get this done today. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'd be happy to, to look into this more, I mean, outside of budget adjustment. So do you, do you have enough, Betsy Ann? Yeah, it's, it's not even, a, it's not a requiring a report back, but you're just encouraging the administration to continue yeah. to monitor it monthly mm -hmm. as they have been doing now that they have realized that there's an issue. Right. Yeah. Got it. All right. Um, so the next issue uh, that I have flagged is the 27-53 reserve. And as Adam Gresham's testified this morning, what they're trying to do um, this year is prepay um, this for next fiscal year. Does anybody have concerns with that? No. no. What reserve is this? It's the, when you have an extra pay period. Oh, so when you okay. have 53 okay. weeks instead of 52 weeks. Got it. Fine. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Is everybody fine with that one now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, oh, Marcia. <laughs> Sorry. I, I am fine with it. It is necessary, but uh, rather than having it come in at budget adjustment, wouldn't it have been better to pre-plan for it in the first place? Yeah, I think what happened is that when they did their mid-year review, they found out they had more money, and so they decided to take care of it this oh. year as a prepayment. As a prepayment. Like next year. Okay. Next so it's not going to the budget next year. Okay, I like that idea. <clears throat> Which is going to our next issue with respect to the Secretary of State's office, the $450,000, is the testimony we heard from Adam Gresham was that that was the same reason um, they would be a next year's budget. The only thing that's a little puzzling there is that the Secretary of State's office did not request it. But I, I think it's a budget issue of just prepaying. Right. But does anybody have a, any concerns about that? No, it was for the elections, right? It, it's for printing ballots oh, the cost and of other elections by costs, right. as I understand. Okay. Because, that's that's what what I say. No, because it's a one-time expense, it's not every year, although it's every other year. <laughs> um, I mean, the danger when you prepay stuff is you've made next year's budget a little easier to make, but the base of the budget is really higher than what you're showing 
I hate for that's the danger. And I'm not, I'm all for prepaying and staying out of debt. Um, it's just, it's a danger because you're fooling yourself. You go back the following year, if these weren't one-time expenses and you say, geez, you know, so we're already mm -hmm. a couple million dollars in a hole. It's, it's the argument that was used on education of using one-time money to keep education rates whole that next year mm -hmm. you don't have that one time on. It's the same argument. I'm not disagreeing with it. I'm just saying we should be sensitive to it. I, though I do want to repay. Better to prepay than spend it on something frivolous. So we're okay with that. And in your memo, do you want to make reference that, to, that you're okay with it? Do you want to provide commentary on um, your understanding that this is, these are prepayments? Listen to our tape if you want the commentary. That's what you can tell them. No, I think that might be a good idea for both um, the, uh, the 27 slash 53 reserve and the Secretary of State's money. So we understand that they're prepayments. Okay, so you make note of that. Okay. Um, so that brings us to. Okay, the transportation fund issue, which I explained, is just a, a is to is the amount that they put here is actually a reduction of about three hundred thousand dollars, and that is according to Meta Townsend, it's what they need for the Pay Act. The, the, the original amount was higher than they needed. Does anybody have any concerns about that? So that brings us to our last issue. Well, two. We have two more issues. One is the, uh, and I skipped it, I apologize. Where is it? The retirement issue with the judiciary. Do we have a final number on that? Is it zero? Or? Well, no. Uh, according to Adam Gresham's calculations, that in FY20 they'll actually run a surplus of fifty-three thousand. But fifty-three thousand. But is that? I actually forget what uh, the court administrator said. Is that based upon them leaving a judge position and the associated uh, staffing that goes with it vacant? No, not not, a court, not what Adam Gresham presented us. It was purely doing a calculation for judiciary the way they do it for the rest of the state government and, and doing what they did. In the, yeah, but they have a vacancy now. And so he did it based on payroll. Right, and there is a, a vacancy rate that they, they take into account. Okay, then fine. I, I think it's zero. He thinks there's going to be a surplus that's going to cover the entire less than amount. Jim? Uh, that vacancy in the court just happened. So if he was looking at actual payrolls, um, it's just recently that that judge was elevated to the Supreme Court, like within the last month. So probably hasn't even shown up in the okay. payroll. Uh, his first day was last week in the Supreme Court. The state of the state, or last week was his first week. Mm -hmm. Marsha? Oh. So we're okay with leaving that issue alone? And let the record show that the mm -hmm. member from Chittenden passionately tried to get more money for the judiciary and failed. Do we want to explain why we're leaving that alone? That might be good idea. Okay, we can do that. I think we can do that for Adam Gresham's yep. memo that he provided us this morning. Is that okay, Patsy? Yes. All right. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know when she did. So. If she stayed on to the end of the year. I don't know. So our final issue is the Agency of Human Services and their request to change the language uh, to allow um, for multiple deputy secretaries in AHS. Right now, they can only have one deputy secretary. Currently, they actually have none. 
Um, but they're only allowed that one. And the proposal from Mike Smith was to allow two, which is similar to the Agency of Education and the EGS in, in ag, agriculture. Marshall. Does anyone know how many divisions there are within the Agency of Education or ag? AHS has, I believe, six. Yeah. So each one of those has a commissioner mm -hmm. that heads that division. And deputies. And one of them got three deputies. And deputies three deputies. under those commissioners. So I'm wondering, in AG, are there, how many commissioners are there in AG? And how many commissioners are there in the Education. Education. Bob, I, I don't have a problem with what he's proposing, but I have a problem with the depth of some of the like social services. They've got a couple melded together. They've got three deputy commissioners. People complain in that agency that nobody hears what people are saying at the tops. But the whole organizational structure bothers me, but two commissioners doesn't. For two deputy commissioners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my only point, Matt. No, go ahead. My only point would be that as you change titles, in, such as in this instance, you also change the pay rate. And I realize how large the Agency of Human Services is, but you've got a lot of people at the top. A lot of commissioners, a lot of deputies. Um, I think I want to hear a little bit more about what the organizational structure would look like after having appointed two deputy secretaries. We did a diagram of how it was split up the various right. subunits of the Agency of Human Services. Mm -hmm. Like on one side was going to be Health, mental health, and what was the third? Um, it was all the healthcare related ones. Oh, Health Connect. Yeah. Health Connect, health, and mental health would be mm -hmm. under one deputy secretary, and then everything else would be under another deputy mm -hmm. secretary. Yes. Yes, um, uh, two questions. Uh, um, First, first is more of a comment. I think I would prefer to go this way with two deputy secretaries than what others in the building have suggested from time to time, and that is break it up into several agencies, and then you'll have even more cost because you'll have multiple secretaries and secretary offices, and um, so that would be one concern of Owen. Uh, but the other thing is, and what, maybe this is more of a question, I, he wasn't asking for any money. Does that mean no money the rest of this fiscal year, or is this going to cause them to, to Marsha's point, an additional appropriation when they do the budget next year? Um, and that would be the question I would have. It's easy to sign off on another deputy secretary, you just move, you know, people around in your your shop and don't come back to us and ask for any money this year. But, you know, if they build a budget for next year, well, we've got another office. I, I think that's just a good question. Um, well, it's a concern we might want to put in my mind, just assuming that, you know, I don't know, I mean, does this cause uh, an increase in appropriation. Everything was flat next year because of the addition of a new title. Uh, just to confirm the language that was proposed, it's not a uh, specifically two deputies. That's the proposal, um, but the language that's proposed is may appoint such number of deputy secretaries as the secretary deems necessary. That is the same language that uh, AOE has, um, but just to confirm, it's not only two deputy secretaries. Okay, it could be any number of secretaries. Yes. 
Oh, yeah. I, I would put so a little bit of bumper garden on that. Then I would. I, two is clearly what he described to us. Yeah. And I don't think I would want to add language such that he would appoint six for his. I, I agree with that. I think we yeah. should be straight back. Because you're right. He yeah. could. With the, and, and, it, and it may not be him. It may be somewhere down the road, and all of a sudden we've got. Oh yeah. I need a new office building. Well, all your commissioners can all of a sudden become deputy deputy secretaries if you want right. to. And, uh, and then they, they have a sit commissioner under them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Uh, JP, uh, just re I've just reviewed this very carefully. Um, Secretary Smith has uh, recommended no changes whatsoever to his current staffing chart. And some of them do include uh, a commissioner and three deputy commissioners, and there's quite a few deputies. And so they're, they're, they're not, in my opinion, they might be a little top heavy. But anyway, he has made no changes with his proposal except to add the one deputy secretary. But I'm thinking that the language that he can add as many as he wants might not be real good. Maybe, maybe a limit on it, my personal opinion. Yeah, I don't have a real problem with him adding another. Because he's got some major issues in that in that agency that I think he's working on hard, and I, from what I know, I think um, and he's probably a demand to tackle these issues. So does everybody agree we should, should suggest a yeah. a, a, a word yeah. change mm -hmm. to limit it to two right. deputy yeah. secretaries? Yeah, right. And then can we put it consistent in with the testimony we heard from? Uh, Mike Smith, the Secretary of, of HS. Yes, sir. I thought that, that, that was his plan. plan. Sounds very good. Should we ask the question or make the assumption that this does not have any budgetary implications now? Or yes, we should definitely say it's our assumption that this does not have any budgetary impact this year. We don't know about next year. Can we ask that question? I mean, I think a folks should know what they're committing to. Well, I think we can raise the concern. We don't know what the budgetary impact will be next year. Right. We need that. I'm not sure. sure if they can get someone hired for this budget year. Yeah. I, yeah, it's a pretty high position. Excuse me. Uh, Jay, the secretary testified that that's another reason he wants to try to get this moving because it's, it takes a while yes. to hire a, a qualified person for it. Mm -hmm. And he, again, probably a good man to try to tackle some of the issues, but he needs to help. He wants to do it sooner than later, which I know he said he, this will allow him to do it with the uh, budget adjustment. Is everybody okay with this? Is, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the other issue um, I'm just going to put Rob on the spot just briefly is overtime pay for state police. You sat in on appropriations testimony, and I believe you're fine with their explanation of their overtime? I, uh, I was. Um, it's a twofold one. It's for officers and then also the dispatch centers. And as we know, they've had a hard time filling the slots. I think that they're mm -hmm. uh, authorized for 325. <clears throat> I don't know. I think they're at like 288. And they've got some members who can call up for deployment. So it's, it's unfortunately very legitimate. Mm -hmm. I was lost for the our digital district. No one to Massachusetts. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Welcome, Mom. Yeah. Oh, got more pay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said this start. All right, so the last issue that, that's not in this memo at all, which we took testimony in front of the state auditor, Doug Hopper, yesterday on. And I think we've resolved that we're fine with the position. But we may just want to put in the memo, given that it's no, we we're in the middle of that, um, that we were told to look into that. It is just say that we're fine with the state auditor hiring an additional auditor um, for funded through funded through um, tip, the tip the tip payments and a reduction in software costs by bringing some software in house. Mm -hmm. Is that is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Okay. Good. Are there any issues that I feel to, to raise? I think everything else that was highlighted for us, we've
dealt with earlier. That's the end of That hits everything that I had marked um, that you needed to address or you wanted to address. Yes, Marty. No, we get a single sole copy for the entire committee. Okay. Paper. Yeah, they, they, and they do not send them electronically. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's just a matter of answering. It looks like education has one deputy secretary, but several division directors. Division directors, yeah. which are a couple of pay grades down from a commissioner or a deputy commissioner. From their website. Oh, and another, may I have another piece of information? Um, companies, that are, companies that we have outsourced to are supposed to uh, save the government, the state government, at least 10%. I thought it was one of them, Did you find that? I've been looking for that legislation, and I can't. I, I have asked someone in the know. Mm. Okay, you can watch that. <laughs> so, Betsy, yes, you have everything? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I can put this together. Are, is the committee going to stay to take a vote or so that it should be from the whole committee? Or should I just have it be from the chair and vice chair to the chair and vice chair of that committee? Or what okay. is your plan? Okay, so the, the memo received from a probes came from the chair mm -hmm. to our chair. Okay. Do you want to draft it as a memo back from the chair to the, that chair? Yeah, maybe with enemy just yes. that I... Yes, you're going to... Dealt with this. Okay, sounds good. I will do that. I will go down and do that now. Yep. And... Well, I'll stick around. Sounds good. And um, just to confirm, so there were a few other more minor things, like reversions back to the general fund when there's a surplus. Do you want the memo to at least acknowledge that you looked at those, or is it just really not necessary to address those in the memo? I, I, I think you could put in the, we looked at everything that was highlighted in the okay. memo. That sounds uh, good. And, and here are our concerns. Okay, that sounds great. Great. All right. Terrific. I'll be back. Thank you. Thank you.